Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, Lancaster University. Um, as you can see from the net from the screen, my name is Dr. Jim Weil, and I'm a scientist here in. Uh, well, I basically do space physics. I'm a space scientist, and I work in the Department of Communication Systems and the Department of Physics. Uh, and so, what I wanted to tell you about this afternoon, for just um, the next hour or so, was just some of the kind of work that we're doing that leads me to think and leads me to say that we live on, on an electric Earth. And so there's quite a few things I'm going to try and get in. I've got a few demos and a few different displays, as you can see, lined up. A couple of them took a few minutes to get going because Windows wasn't playing. But then, uh, so hopefully by the end of this, this session, you'll get a better feeling for the kind of environment we live in in the space environment. So at the moment, you, you should all have one of these. Anyone not got a pair of glasses? Really? You not got one? No. At the moment, you're not going to need these. You only need these slides for a few minutes. I'm sorry, this isn't Avatar. It's not all in 3D. Well, I am in 3D, but... So the th when, I, when you get to the 3D bit, I'll let you know and you can, you can put these on. If you just keep them on all the time, you'll miss half the stuff on the screen and just feel sick. But there you go, up to you. So what I'm going to do is, as well, I'm going to dim the lights a little bit. I'm going to try and dim them if I can figure it out. Why do I think we live in electric Earth? Well, for a living, I study this. Does anyone know what this is? Northern Lights, yeah, excellent. So everyone knows about the Northern Lights. Has anyone seen the Northern Lights? Seen the film. Seen the film. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't really work, uh, work uh, in, the, in the same way in the films it does in real life. Really amazing phenomena. If you go up to the high latitudes, up to the North Pole area, around the Arctic Circle, you can see these lights in the night sky, and they, they glitter, and they, they dance, and they shift and shimmer in the night sky, and they can be really bright, bright enough to kind of read a newspaper by. Very bright lights in the night sky, reds and greens, and it's really very magical. Um, and, the, and the question is, and for a long time, people have wondered what causes them. So I study the, the physics behind this. So we're going to talk a bit about these, but before we can do that, we've got to kind of roll right back to the beginning and think about why I think, what, what, what's this got to do with electricity? What's this got to do with the Earth? So then, let's go right back. This is an experiment you probably did a long time ago in, um, in the classroom, in the science classroom, where you basically take a coil of wire and you wrap it around a piece of metal, usually a, a, an iron core of some kind, a, piece of, a little piece of iron, and can connect it up to a battery. And if you do that, this iron isn't magnetic, so you have a compass near it, it'll point towards the North Pole, like compasses do. But what happens is when you, you flick that switch and close the circuit, an electric current will flow through the wire, and you basically get an electromagnet. So a magnetic field is set up down the core of this, this twist of wire, and it sets up a magnetic field. And so from experiments like that, it, it's really easy to see that electricity and magnetism are really closely linked. They're kind of like part of the same family. And we can demonstrate that really easily um, with, uh, well, this is basically what we have on screen. This is just a little piece of metal with a few wires wrapped around it and a 9-volt battery, the same sort of thing you power your alarm clock with. And so, um, well, is anyone feeling strong? strong. Someone over there is feeling strong. Do you want to come up here? <laughs> Do you want to do a battle of the sexes here? <laughs> Are you too gentle me to take on a girl? <laughs> Come on then. Come on then. So it's, it's obviously a, a battle of schools and sexes. OK. Now then. So inside here. It's slightly unfair, but don't worry. So, so inside here, we have our electromagnet. It's not, it's not a prize fight. Don't worry. You don't need to get too ready. So. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to, you see, that's not magnetic. So I'm going to flick the switch, the battery's turned on, and it becomes magnetic. So it's just nine volts holding those together. So can you two just get, pull on those, one end each? I'll tell you, why don't you have the pink end? There's a stereotype for you. <laughs> OK, now then, don't go for it too much. I was doing this at a science festival, and there were only a few injuries. If by some chance you manage to pull this apart, obviously you're going to go in opposite directions, so just be a bit careful. OK, so go on, give that a pull. I'm going to hold it in the middle just to kind of stabilise it. Go on. OK. Oh, OK, OK, OK. OK. <laughs> OK, so, all right then, thank you very much. Shall I take, shall I try? Hang on. Do you want to try with me? <laughs> OK. It's <laughs> already. OK, so go on. It's not going to work. OK. And the obvious, the obvious thing to be really mischievous is had I flicked the switch, had I flicked the switch while that was happening, then these would have just come apart very easily and we would have had some broken limbs. So, OK, so thanks to you guys for, for a bit of help there. So electricity and magnetism are really closely linked together. And we, there's really simple, fun demos we can do to kind of generate that, to, to demonstrate that. But 
if we think about where electricity comes from, if you take a motor apart or a generator apart, you get something that looks a bit like this, so a kind of textbook image of a, of a this is actually a, a motor or a generator. And so what you do to build one of these things is you take a coil of wire and you place it on some kind of rotating mechanism, it's actually called the, the rotor in a motor system, and uh, you have a couple of those. When you put current through these coils of wire, they generate a strong magnetic field, just like we've seen. And that reacts with the magnetic field in the casing. There's some static magnets in the casing. And the, and the difference in the magnetic field causes the, the rotor to, to rotate. So we can do it in one of two ways. We can either put electricity in, which causes a magnetic field to be generated, which causes this thing to turn around. So that's a motor. Okay? We, put, we put electricity in, and the thing rotates. Alternatively, we can force it to rotate by putting some effort in, some work in, and what will happen is, what will come out of the wires attached is electricity will drive charge carrying electrons through these wires to come out. So a motor and a generator are basically the same thing. One you put effort in and get electricity out, one you put electricity in and get, get effort out. And so that's the kind of thing that underpins all these, all these little mechanisms. So I have a, you know, the standard sort of torch. All I'm doing here is as I, as I do that, I'm spinning a mechanism like this that generates a current. And that underpins everything about man-made electricity, really. So it doesn't really matter how you try and generate electricity of the kind you use in your home. If you use a wind turbine, if you're a company that has wind turbines, you're using the energy of the wind to rotate that turbine. That rotary motion is converted in a generator into electricity. Now, in a, in a conventional power station, it's a bit bigger. So you have a turbine that looks a bit like this. So this has got all the magnets in. But it's also got some, some uh, basically, uh, what looks like a jet engine if you take it apart. It's got a turbine which you can put steam through. And as steam comes through, it causes it to spin very fast. And you either generate your steam using nuclear power or coal power or gas power to, to heat up water. And you get big power stations like this, and they generate electricity that we have in our home. So they're all relying on the same kind of mechanisms to generate electricity. Um, the question is, what kind of electricity is there out there in the natural world? Does anyone shout out the obvious ones? Lightning. Yeah, lightning. Anyone else? Any others? Fossil fuels, well, they're energy, and we'll come back to that, but they're not electricity, so we, need to, we burn those to get the energy out to make electricity. So, yes and no. What about other electricity, any, any sort of natural electricity that you count on most days? I can't hear, sorry. There's a, what was it? Someone out there said static electricity. You know when you take off your jumper, or you've been stroking the cat, or you've been running downstairs? Okay. There's one more, there's a very natural one. Solar, solar power is power, but it's not electricity. OK, well, we'll come back to it in a minute. We'll come back. So the first one we came to was lightning. Now, lightning is, is the really obvious one. Um, we get lots of charge building up in a cloud layer. It's at a much higher potential than the ground. And so what it does is it tries to jump this potential gap. The charge comes down to the ground and neutralizes it. And actually, the mechanism that forms lightning still isn't very well understood. We kind of have a rough idea. But there are still jobs out there in science to figure out exactly what makes lightning. Um, and some of those jobs actually are quite cool. Uh, some of the science, I found this uh, quite recently while doing some work. These guys, have, their job is to study lightning. Now, it's very hard to measure the voltage from a lightning bolt because you don't know where it's going to hit. So what they do is they create their own natural light, or they trigger lightning by taking rockets, a large rocket, probably about a couple of meters tall, attaching a wire to the end and launching it into a thundercloud. So you know how you hear about you shouldn't fly a kite in a thunderstorm. These guys have a rocket-powered wire straight into the cloud, and the electricity comes back down the wire, and they can measure the strength of the bolt, and they can take film of the bolt, lightning bolts coming down. And you'll see there's several bolts coming down one wire there. And so this is what these guys do for a living. It looks like a good job to me. This, is, this, like, this last video is my favorite, actually. We've got a really massive lightning bolt. So these guys have got equipment on their base station to measure the strength of the voltage. So lightning we tend to think of. And there's lots of fancy other things high up in the atmosphere. Things called elves and sprites, lightning that go up into space. So they're not kind of fairies. This is just a name that some scientists have given. One of the other natural things, I didn't hear anyone shout it out. Pardon, pardon me if you did. I just didn't hear it. Electricity in the natural world is an electric eel. These things aren't actually eels. They're fish. Someone went, ah. Oh. They're about two meters long when they're fully grown. OK, so a bit taller than me. They weigh about 20 kilos. Uh, and they use electricity for hunting and for de de defense and, uh, and for feeding. So what they will do is they'll find a fish that they want to eat, sidle up next to it, give it an electric shock, which will render it unconscious, and then eat it. Um, and they're quite big, and they can give quite big electric shocks, up to about 
500 volts for about 20 seconds. So enough to take out a horse or you or me if we trod on one or, or aggravated it. So these are quite things, and they generate electricity chemically. They almost have like naturally occurring batteries in their, in their abdomen, and they can generate electricity that way. So that's kind of natural electricity we don't think of very much. St static is one we've all come across. We don't often see this effect where you actually see the spark, but we've all had that experience where you, you, certain kind of uh, fabrics or certain behavior rubbing up against, say, the carpet, it causes charge to be, de uh, to be deposited on you, and it then gets out and into ground level. And so this kind of uh, static charge builds up all the time. Does anyone have any idea how big the voltage is there? What sort, how many volts do you think is in a little bolt of static? Zero, two. Zero, two. Higher or lower? Higher. Higher. It's like Bruce Forsyth, isn't it? Higher or lower? How many? Go on, then. Let's have some more. Ten. Ten? Five. Five, OK. Well, to, a, big one, a big one that you really feel is typically about 10,000 volts. <laughs> so you're a little bit low. Some of the research suggests that below 5,000 volts, you don't even feel it. And there's a reason for that, and that's because it's so quick. It's happening so fast. The actual amount of energy delivered, even though it's a high voltage, is very small. And so you don't even feel it. And the last one that I was going to come to is the northern lights, which is my favorite because it's what I study. So you can guess that I'm quite interested in the northern lights. And this is a, an electric effect. And we're going to look at in the next few minutes how, how that electric effect happens, how this light is created in the night sky, totally naturally. But if we're going to compare, say, the aurora borealis to some static electricity or how much electricity an electric eel has in it, we do have to think about some numbers. We do have to, it can't just say small, big, large. Science is all about quantifying things as well. So we do have to do some numbers. And there are only two bits of math in this entire, in this entire talk. And this is it. And I'm sure it's nothing you've seen, but you haven't seen before. OK, so guys, has everyone seen this before? Anyone? Yeah, yeah OK. Well, you'll say yes, rather than put your hand up. OK. So, we know how many volts there are in electricity coming in a particular electric system usually, and that's just the ability of the system to drive electric current, electric charge particles around the system. We usually know how many, what the current is. That's the amount of charge carriers moving through. So we have high voltage and high current. It means we've got lots of energy to cause electricity to move through, say, a wire, and lots of charge carriers to carry it. So there'll basically be lots of energy being transferred. And when you multiply those two numbers together, you get power in watts. So this light bulb is 6 watts. So it means it, it tells you how much energy it's using all the time, how much energy, what the rate of energy consumption of this light bulb is. But because that's a rate of energy, so six watts, I don't know how much energy it will use in, say, an hour, or two hours, or 10 minutes. That, that six watts is a constant rate of delivery. So to get the actual amount of energy, we have to take that power that we just calculated and multiply it by the time. And when we do that, we get energy. So one watt, if you multiply it by one second, gives you one joule of energy. That's what one watt is. It's one joule of energy per second. So at the bottom line, you get this, this energy, which is a measure of, um, of how much energy is being transferred in, in a system. And so I've created a little, a little grid of all the different phenomena we're looking at there, just to, plick, to, to sort of pick a couple of numbers out and think about what we're talking about. Um, and there at the top, so we've got some static electricity there. We've got um, the electric eels, your domestic home voltage, a lightning bolt, um, a, a wind turbine generator, and, and the northern lights. And so you can see the voltages vary greatly. And actually, some of the big numbers are you know, static. That's quite surprising that it's so high. Much higher than the 500 volts you get from electric eel, 240 volts you get out of a socket in the wall. Um, this MV is, is megavolts. It's a million volts. So a lightning bolt's about 200 million volts. They vary, but that's a good rough number. A wind turbine generates about 34,000 volts, 34,500 volts, it says there. Uh, and, and the aurora borealis is driven by voltage coming from space, which is about 50,000 volts. So actually, it's less, less volts than in a lightning storm there, or in a lightning bolt. But of course, we have those other numbers we have to take into account, things like current. So again, 13 amps is the current you can draw out of one of these wall sockets, the kind of thing you have on the wall at home. That's the maximum current. Um, and if you multiply it by the voltage, then you actually get this number, 3,120 watts. That's 3 kilowatts, 3,000 watts, is the most you can get out of one of these wall sockets before things start to go wrong. Normally, the fuse will go or your wiring will melt, or if something's very bad, and a fire will start. So you get about three kilowatts. If we think about the, uh, the electric eel, 500 volts at about an amp, that'll give a rate of about 500 watts. So the rate of energy delivered from an electric eel is actually much less than you get out of the wall socket, which isn't surprising, really. It's a little fish this big compared to that thing that's plugged into the national grid. Um, on the other hand, though, if we take 
our, our static electricity, 10,000 volts at 15 amps is actually 150,000 watts, 150 kilowatts of energy. So that seems really big. I think you look at that number, it's quite surprising that a static electricity has got this really high power output, much higher than, say, an electric eel what's coming out of the wall. So that's, I have to think about why that is in a moment. Things like lightning, you multiply these numbers together, 50,000 watts, watts at 200 million <coughs> volts gives you uh, 10 million megawatts, so 10 million million watts. A wind turbine, if you run it, it, it that'll do about 5 megawatts, 5 million watts of energy. And uh, the Aurora Borealis is yeah, about 500,000 megawatts, or 500 billion watts, depending on how you write it down. So you get these really big numbers. But again, this time thing comes back. So the static electricity is a really good example of that. 150,000 watts coming out of a bit of static electricity. But it only lasts for one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. So although it's really high power, it's really quick. And if you do those multiplications together, you actually get this number 0 0.0002 joules. Tiny amount of energy in that, just because it's high power but very quick. Your electric eel, that'll shock you for, say, two seconds is a kind of typical sort of healthy, well, unhealthy dose to get from an electric eel. You'll get about 1,000 joules out of that, so that's, that's a reasonable amount of energy. Much higher than the energies that you see in those defibrillator pads to restart stopped hearts. This will stop your heart. That's, that's kind of what it's designed to do. That's what nature and evolution have come about to make it do. If you think about your wall socket, if you leave it for in over a day, you get about 270 million joules of energy out of it, 270 megajoules. So that's over a whole day. So again, a steady power supply. If you leave it on all day, that's what you get. A lightning bolt, again, 100 million, sorry, 10 million megawatts, 10 million million watts of, of energy in a lightning bolt. But it only lasts for three microseconds, three millionths of a second. So although it's high power, again, it's one of those fast things. It's like static electricity. But because the numbers are just so big, even though it's so fast, you still get a good, num good healthy number out of it. 300 megajoules. Actually, it's quite similar to this 270 megajoules. What that says is, in that one three millionth of a second lightning bolt, there's about the same amount of energy as your wall socket will give out in a whole day. So that's how the numbers start to scale up. Your wind turbine actually chucks out more energy probably than a lightning bolt by about half as much again, 430 something megajoules if over a day. So you get more energy out of a wind turbine than you would out of a, um, out of a, um, a lightning bolt. And then my last one is the Aurora Borealis, which I have there. So it's about 50,000 volts at 10 million amps, gives you 500,000 megawatts of energy, of power rather, a good aurora display might last for an hour. So over that hour, it'll actually deliver 2 times 10 to the power 15 joules. So that's 2 with 15 zeros after it. So let me just see if I can get my head around that. So that's 2,000 million million joules of energy. So, so it's 2,000 million megajoules, much higher than these. So these energies coming from space, they're actually ordered left to right in terms of the total amount of energy coming in. These things are all electric. Most of them are out there in the natural world. There's a couple of man-made ones in there just for comparison. Massive amounts of energy coming from out there in space. So what I want to talk about for the rest of this, this session is just where's that energy coming from and how does it end up, create, get, how does it end up in the sky and how does it end up making some, some light. So does anyone know where it comes from? The energy ultimately for, that makes the aurora? Yeah, the sun. Yeah, that's right. So, so we think about the sun. Um, you know, tropical Hawaiian island sunset. Actually, no, it's my hometown in North Wales, but there we go. But the sun, we tend to think of it as this, as this sort of constant in the sky. It's always there, um, sometimes behind the clouds, but you know, it always comes up every morning, goes away every evening. It looks unchanging, it's predictable. So it, it's, it's cyclic, so it gives us the seasons. So for example, we know that the, the sun, depending on where we live, controls how much sunlight we get. We get less sunlight at the poles than you do at the equator. So it controls, for example, seasons and, and how, how much energy we can get on a certain area to grow crops. Areas that don't get very much sunlight, we know that they're very cold, so you get these stark comparisons. Only over a space of a few thousand miles, you get very stark landscape differences. Um, and actually, the sun is the source of all our energy. So someone earlier said solar energy, and someone over there said fossil fuels. Actually, that's, that's natural energy just come from the sun. If you think about all these things, where do we get our energy from? So we've got a whole series of clippings here. Top left, trees and plants. Been around on Earth for billions of years. Those trees and plants are designed to absorb energy from the sun. They interact with atmospheric gases, and that's how they get energy to grow and reproduce. Well, when they die, they lay down 
they, they, they decompose, and actually that's the part of the beginning of, of the fossil fuel cycle. But more importantly, the plants are also provide food to various different forms of life, us included, but from little microbes up to, up to mammals. The plant cycle, which is taking energy from the sun, feeds into larger up the food chain. As those animals die, they then decompose and ultimately produce fossil fuels. That's why they're called fossil fuels, because they're the fossils of dead animals almost. We can then extract that. So when we get oil or we get coal, which will, and uh, oil we can refine into petrol and diesel, or we can get gas, all of that has come from decomposing animals that lived off plants which took their energy from the sun. So the sun is ultimately responsible for all those fossil fuels. We then burn them and produce electricity, which, will make elect uh, which makes energy for us, but ultimately these are coming right back from the start there. That's energy coming from the sun. Um, nuclear power we'll come to in a minute. But wind power, the sun is driving large weather systems. So you can see on the globe over there, we've got some speeded up animations of cloud formations, weather systems. That wind, which has been driven ultimately by solar energy in the atmosphere, we can turn into electricity. We can turn sunlight directly into electricity by use of solar cells. These are semiconductor cells which respond to sunlight by creating electricity. And then also tidal power, some of which is coming from the moon. It's the moon and the sun's motion around the Earth drive the tides. But also some of the currents are driven by water temperature gradients, which is coming from solar energy. These will also produce electricity. So all these forms of energy we use ultimately start off, the energy starts off coming from the sun. And all that happens is it just gets packaged up differently, and we have different ways of getting it back out again. The only one that's different here is nuclear, ener nuclear energy. And that doesn't come from our sun. But most of the radioactive elements that we put into nuclear reactors, plutonium and uranium, those are made naturally in the hearts of stars. So deep in the core of a star where the pressure is huge, when the star's getting old, it, the stars make energy by basically taking materials and fusing them together. So you can fuse two hydrogen atoms into a helium atom and some energy is given off. Once all the hydrogen's gone, stars burn helium, then they start going further and further down the periodic table. Those heavy elements, that uranium, the plutonium and things that we tend to think of in terms of nuclear power, they started, those elements started in the heart of distant stars. And when those stars died and exploded, they were cast out into the solar system. So our sun didn't make most of the heavy stuff that we put in nuclear reactors. But actually other suns did. And the really freaky thing to think about is that virtually every heavy, heavy element in your body was manufactured in a star somewhere that then exploded and cast out into the universe somewhere. So you really are made from stardust. It's incredible to think. So, OK, you might think, well, I was born. How did, how did that come from a star? All those atoms, all those materials that were your, got into your mother when, you were, when, you were, uh, when she was pregnant, all that material came through food, came through different cycles. Ultimately, most of it came from um, distant stars and actually has been floating through the universe and finally ended up in random configuration that made you guys. And obviously, when we all die and we decompose, all that goes back into the system and we just keep getting recycled. So it's one big system, really. So if we think about our sun, I think I should be able to change that. Yes. If we think about our sun, it's this big ball of, in the sky, this big bright thing. Looks pretty featureless. How big is it? Well, I've just got a little anim a cartoon here that shows how big the sun is. If you imagine you had a coffee table set of the planets and you could just put them next to each other and see how big they are, how big would they be? So the sun's in the middle. Some of the big things in our solar system, Saturn and Jupiter, a bit smaller. Earth is down here. So the Earth is tiny compared to the Sun. It's about a hundredth of the size, hundredth of the diameter, and hundredth of the, uh, uh, sorry, a millionth of the volume. So the Sun actually is this tiny, tiny, is this, sorry, is this massive thing, and the Earth is, is tiny in comparison. It's most of the material in our solar system. But it doesn't really look the same if you look at the Sun in a slightly different way as it does when you just look out in the morning and look up at the sky and see this, this yellow disk. If we, take it, if we do some tricks, we can actually reveal the true nature of it. And so if you think about what it looks like, when the sun's in a sunset and there's lots of dust, we know it gets this red color. And it's not quite as bright. You can tend to look at it more because the light's coming through more of the atmosphere. But we used to it being this very bright thing. Um, Galileo, back in the, in the 17th century, when he was building the first ever telescopes, so he was an Italian, he built some telescopes, very crude ones, the first ever. And he could see dark patches on the surface of the sun. Now, he was using a telescope. He probably learned very quickly that pointing the telescope at the sun is a tremendously bad idea and learned how to, how to handle it and project an image such that, first of all, you could see what you were seeing, and secondly, so you didn't focus the sun's light and set your house on fire. Um, 
And he noticed very quickly that the sun had some features on it, and they tended to move around. Um, now, if we look at our globe over here, I've actually just drawn some features on, they're just going to whiz around the back, but they'll come around in a moment. When Galileo was looking at the sun, he noticed that there were dark patches, and when he looked day after day after day, he realized that these dark patches moved, and their pattern of movement could only be accounted for if the sun actually had features on it, and it was a ball, and it was rotating around. So he saw the dark features, which presumably are coming around to some of you now, and will continue to come around. Quite small features, some of them. And he quickly got onto the idea, well, it's not this disk in the sky, it's a ball, and actually it's spinning round. And so he could see sunspots, and from that he alluded that the sun must be round. It must be a sphere, rather. And so modern day technology, we can do a little bit better than that. So presumably you've seen these kind of things before. Yep. OK, so you take white light and pass it through a glass prism, it breaks off into all the different colours that can make up white light. You can do the same thing naturally. White light or sunlight coming into a rainbow is basically, to form a rainbow, is, is white light being scattered by water droplets in the atmosphere, being split up into this, this pattern that we see on the, on the left. Well, as well as all those visible colours, and we know the sun is very bright in that whitey, yellowy colour, as well as all the visible colours, there's lots of light that we can't see because our eyes have purely been developed to go round and chase woolly mammoths with spears or catch things or grow things and chase each other, either kill each other or find someone to have babies with. So we're used to dealing with the light from our sun and, and, and then everything we need to survive. However, there's bits of the electromagnetic spectrum outside the, uh, those, uh, the, the visible light that we can get used to. So we're, all, we're kind of happy with the idea. We know that there is X-ray radiation, it will pass through your skin but not your bones, so if you put a photographic print a plate under your hand, put your hand on top and pass some X-rays through, you get these kind of images. I'm sure most of us have been to the dentist or a casualty when we've, we've done something, and you get an X-ray. Well, this is just light, it's radiation, but it's just light that we can't detect with our eyes. So other examples are infrared light. So that's what we tend to think of as heat. The next time you go and stand in front of a fire and warm your hands in front of a fire, that red light actually well, you, gives away the fact it's hot. We say red hot. But actually, light that you can't see just outside the visible spectrum called infrared light is what we feel as heat. So that, when it's absorbed by your hand, feels warm. And so you can build images and sensors which are spe especially sensitive to infrared light, and they will give you a different image than if you look in the visible part of the spectrum. But it's still light. It's just a slightly different color, if you like. It's a different color our eyes can't see, different wavelength. And then finally, ultraviolet light, we're very used to. It's the stuff that gives you a suntan. So we put chemicals on our skin that will absorb ultraviolet light so it doesn't get through to our skin. Because if it gets through to our skin, it damages the pigment and we get a sunburn. So ultraviolet light is, is a very energetic form of light. So actually, infrared, as the name suggests, is just out of the red part of the spectrum. It's quite low energy and we can absorb it quite happily and feel its warmth. Ultraviolet is the other end of the visible spectrum, just outside the blue-violet end is quite high energy, and so will do some damage if, if you absorb too much of it. Well, if you look at the sun in ultraviolet light, it looks completely different than it does in visible light. So there's the sun in ultraviolet light. It's actually what we call extreme ultraviolet, very high energy ultraviolet light, viewed from a satellite which sits between the Earth and the sun. Now, the first thing everyone notices is it's green. Well, it's not really green. Remember, this is an ultraviolet image. This is an image showing us where the sun is emitting brightly in ultraviolet and where it's not emitting very much in ultraviolet. So it's kind of like a black and white image or a grayscale image showing us bright and dark regions. But scientists color code them green because they, they do that so they know when they're looking at green images, it's extreme ultraviolet. X-rays are sometimes color coded blue and different wavelengths are just color coded differently. And the first thing you can see is that these features that we saw, you can see on the visible sun, if you view it properly, that rotate round, they actually correspond to features on the sun in ultraviolet light, these regions where we get very bright emissions. So there's some activity going on there that makes the sun brighter. And you can see actually there that you've got sort of several bright regions, and then there's some quite dark regions, and then round the edge of the sun, you can see there's, these, there's some structure and there's sort of like faint lines that are emerging from the sun. And it stands out a lot better if you uh, put it into a movie. So if you put it into a movie, you soon realise that the sun's rotating. This is what Galileo observed by looking at sunspots. And actually, he then, uh, and then you, can, you can see, if you study it over years, that the pattern of behaviour on the sun changes. So there's a date down here. Some of you might be able to see it, some of you might not. But there's about 10 years' worth of movies here just stitched together. So it rotates once every 27 days. So we're looking at a few, a few days' worth of data, then we'll jump onto a year and look at a few days' worth of data and jumping on another year. And you can see that the number of bright and dark regions changes. So this is actually coming towards the end of the movie. There's a couple of bright and active regions there, but not very many. There's lots of dark regions. So this is 2003, 
It's going to go on, I think, to 2004. I think it will now start again. No, no, it's not going to do that. It's going to do 2005. Okay, so it'll start back now again um, in the middle of the 90s. So in 1996, we could see, for example, a couple of bright regions, but mainly dark. 1997, there's a couple more bright regions now. If we look at the sun in 1998, then we start to see some more bright regions. And as activity, we can see things flaring and moving around in 1999. Lots more activity, more of these bright regions, fewer dark regions. 2000 now, we can see the bright regions have covered a lot of the sun. There's lots of activity. And then it starts to decrease again. 2001, we start getting more dark regions. Then 2002, more dark regions again, fewer active regions. So we can watch the sun over about 10 or 11 years, and we see that the amount of activity varies on this cycle, the solar cycle. And you can do it this way. Galileo could do it by just counting the number of sunspots he saw every day. And if you drew a graph over 11 years, you'd see this 11-year this cycle in increase and decrease. And the sun is actually made up of material that we call plasma. So have you, worked, have you guys done much plasma work in your science classes? No, OK, yes. OK, so what are the three phases of matter you know of from science? There are three types of matter that we think about. One of them is I'm standing on, solid. OK, solids, liquid, and gases. So everything's a solid and a liquid or a gas. Great. Unfortunately, it's not quite true, that. What happens if you take a gas? Because normally we think if we take a solid and we heat it, it, it all, all the atoms and the molecules come apart. They're still kind of held together, but they, they turn to a liquid, which is viscous and fluid. And then what happens if we continue to heat that fluid, what will happen is that it will turn to a gas. Those atoms and molecules come apart, and they have enough energy to move around freely. The question is, is what happens if you continue to heat the gas, if you continue to put more and more energy in? Individual atoms inside that gas will start to come apart. So if you have some hydrogen, if you have some hydrogen atoms, or hydrogen molecules in gas, they'll come apart to make hydrogen atoms, continue heating. The hydrogen atoms will come apart and form the nucleus of the atom and some electrons that are spinning around in the outside. They'll be pulled apart. And you end up with a soup of the subatomic ingredients, if you like, electrons and protons, all electrically charged. So it's a big material. It's just the building blocks of matter, and it's very hot. And that's plasma. And the sun's made entirely out of plasma. And since sun is most of what's in the solar system, it's about 99% of all the material in the solar system, then actually most of the solar system is plasma. But we don't talk about it because you don't find it at room temperature and pressure on the lab bench. But most of the stuff in the solar system is actually plasma, this strange state of matter we don't think of very much. And if you look out into the, solar, into the universe, go and look into a dark night sky, you'll see all those twinkling lights, all those stars. Each one of those is a big ball of plasma. So virtually everything you can see in the universe is made of this material plasma. But we don't tend to think about it very much because we don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis here at ground level. And this is plasma, actually. This is the edge of the sun. And you can see plasma is leaving the surface of the sun in the outer atmosphere. It's very hot. It's actually, this is taken in ultra x-ray light. This is light that's, this material's so hot, it's emitting x-rays. And actually, um, it's taken from a spacecraft. And you can see the, the plasma moving around. And it's actually constrained and sitting on magnetic field lines. So if you have a, a magnetic field, the plasma can move up and down it a bit like the beads can on a string. So if you think of a string with some beads, it's easy to get the beads to move from one end to the string to the other. But it's very difficult to get the bead off the string. You have to bring the string with you to do it. So magnetic field and plasma work in exactly the same way. So if you take a still image of the edge of the sun, you can see these loops of magnetic field coming from the surface of the sun. And that's actually this magnetic field threaded onto the magnetic field line, a bit like those beads on, on plasma. Um, just for comparison, that's how big the Earth would be in comparison with this. This is just the edge of the sun, of one bit of the sun. So remember, it's very, very big. So these little fluffy loops are just like detail at the edge of the sun are much bigger than the planet we live on. So it's a huge source of energy. Lots of this hot plasma. This is about 6,000 degrees Celsius. And actually, as we leave the sun, for some very strange reasons we're not fully understanding yet, the temperature goes up until you reach a couple of million degrees Celsius. So it's very, very hot indeed. So obviously, if you stood there, you'd be vaporized instantly into and you'd form a little bunch of plasma molecules, or sorry, plasma particles, and they'd just diffuse off. So. This plasma stuff, it's obviously everywhere, but we don't think of it very much. Well, I've got a, I've got a toy here, um, and I will need to lower the lights for this momentarily, and I'll have to put them back on. But um, let's just have these down for a moment. OK. What I'm also going to do is I'm just going to turn off my display. OK. So what we have here is, a, is a, what you call a plasma globe. You must have seen these before. You can buy them for about 20 quid in Argos now. 
So a few years ago, this was high-tech sci-fi, so the 90, Hollywood movies would have this as sort of some on-stage prop. But actually what's inside here is, is some gas, very thin, not much gas, and there's a voltage being applied to the ball in the middle through a transformer in the base, so it's plugged into the mains. Um, and actually there is an um, electric field setup which is guiding the motion of high-energy particles that are moving around in the gas. And that, they're actually causing little pockets of plasma to be created, because plasma, remember, its material has been broken down into its subatomic particles, and they're electrically conductive. So because they're electrically conductive, they can carry electricity around. And so that's what's happening in here. And we get little pockets of plasma being formed very, very quickly, and then almost instantaneously, that, those, those subatomic particles are, are reforming into, into atoms and molecules of gas, because they don't like being plasma in room temperature. But we can very briefly form some, some room temperature plasma like this. And we can see it's affected by electricity and magnetism because I've got an electric field around me, you all have. We're all electrically conductive and neutral depending on which part of the body we're worrying about. So if I put my finger on it, I'm changing the electric field at that point on the, on the surface and the plasma is responding to that. So we've all seen that done before. But the better way of demonstrating that this is actually an electric property going on and it's electromagnetic is if I take a, a low energy ball, you know, the kind of thing you have at home, if I just place that on top, that will light up of its own accord. So obviously, I, now there's no trickery here. I'm not, I'm not plugged into the mains. Um, it is simply just resting on there. And what's happening is the strong electric fields that are being generated in order to create that plasma in there don't just stop at the glass. They're actually emerging out and coming out into the base again because that's how the, the electric circuit's set up in this device. And that strong oscillating and rapidly changing electric field is exciting the atoms in there and causing them to slam into the side of the glass, which is impregnated with material that makes it light. So that's exactly, it's basically recreating the same effect you get when you plug that into the mains. So it's pretty safe. Um, I do say if you, if you stick your tongue on it and do that, then you know there's a voltage being induced. It's like putting your tongue on one of those nine volt batteries. It's not dangerous, but it's not terribly pleasant. So plasma is clearly electrically, um, an electric, or an electrically um, dominated and, and, uh, and controlled medium. And so because of that, all of the solar material that we were looking at, and I'll just pop the light back on, all of the solar material and the, the weather, the, the, the stuff that flies out from the sun, which we're going to look at in a moment, is all guided by electric and magnetic fields. Unlike the stuff in this room, the gas in this room now is, is, electri is electrically neutral, so it's insensitive to most of the things we're doing now with electricity and magnetism. Plasma wouldn't be, it's very much guided. And so if we take another look at the sun, what you find is, if you take a series of tubes, now we're getting different colours just because we're looking at different camera instruments now. What we've got here is a view of the sun a little bit like one we were looking at a moment ago, so that's the whole sun. And our satellite's got several cameras. The next camera looks at a region around the sun as well, which is this red area, and I'll explain what's happening in a moment. And then there's another camera, which we're seeing is showing this blue area, which looks even wider. So it's a bit like with your camera, you've got a zoom and a wide angle function. You can zoom right in or go to a wide angle shot. These different cameras take different pictures of different zoom and wide. And actually, the, these, these ones are very clever because they, they put a little disc in front of the sun at the end of the camera. So if you're driving into the, sun, if, into the sun, you pull down the sun visor. If you're looking into the sun, you put your hand up to block the sun out so you're not dazzled by the glare. These cameras have little discs, which is what this black thing is. Actually, it's, it's block, blocking out most of the sunlight. So they, instead of seeing the glare of, of radiation coming from the sun, they can see what's coming out from the region around the sun. And then finally, in the middle, we've just superimposed that image of the sun so we can see where it is and how big it would be. And what you can see from this is that the sun is constantly streaming matter out into the solar system. This is plasma. This is this material the sun's made of, always coming out into the solar system around us. And so actually, you can see it, it's not steady. Regions come and go, so it's blasting out all the time. It's coming out about a million tons per second. It's streaming out, and it comes past the Earth as well. By the time it reaches the Earth, it's moving about 500 kilometers every second. Um, and you can see, as well as this streaming effect that's going all the time, it's called the solar wind, that's shifting and material coming out. Every now and again, there's almost a big explosion of material that comes out, like that one. And they, that is a solar explosion. It's what we call a coronal mass ejection. The outer atmosphere of the sun is called the corona, so it's a mass, it's a load of material from the corona being ejected. So a coronal mass ejection, or a CME, these occur every now and again. You can see a few of them in this movie being fired out in all directions. There goes one, uh, there goes another one, and every now and again one will be fired out towards the Earth. So one comes towards the Earth, something interesting happens, because as it reaches a spacecraft like this, the high-energy plasma is blitzing through all the detectors and the satellite and actually damaging 
the, 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 uh, and, and, and causing noise on all the detectors. So that snowing you're seeing on there is just radiation and, and energetic particles in the plasma coming out from the sun. It's heading towards the spacecraft that's taking the movie. And actually, the spacecraft that's taking the movie is directly between them, the sun and the Earth. So a couple of days after it went past the spacecraft, that all arrived at the Earth. And, uh, well, I can show you what happened to the Earth in, in a minute. So, the problem here is that you're looking at the sun with only one camera. So, if you imagine, if everyone puts their hand up against one eye for a minute, go on, you know you want to. Okay, all of a sudden your depth perception stops working. Okay, so how far away your finger is from your eye is quite hard to judge if you do that. Okay, okay? now then, so what the problem we have here is we have a one-eyed spacecraft looking at things coming towards it. The analogy is we have a one-eyed spacecraft and someone, the sun, is throwing cricket balls at its head at 100 miles an hour. And we're expecting, well, it's, it's hard to see it coming. If someone did that to you, you'd see a red blur and then the last half inch before it hit your nose, it would get very big and then you'd have a broken nose. So this is why you have two eyes, so you can do depth perception. Well, NASA decided they didn't like just having one spacecraft looking at the sun, so they decided to build a pair of them. So they built a pair of them called Stereo. Stereo because there's two of them, two channels but actually it also stands for the Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory. So it was kind of a bit of a convoluted acronym there, but they had to get in. Launched it in 2006. And what they have is two satellites looking at the sun from slightly different angles. So the, sun, the, uh, the Earth here is going round the sun. It actually goes round that way. If we look down from the, above the North Pole, really, it's going that way. So they built one satellite that flew ahead of the Earth and one that went behind the Earth. These obviously aren't to scale. And then the idea is if things come out of the sun towards the Earth, these cameras would have slightly different views of it happening. That's how stereoscopic vision works. So that's how your eye works, because you're seeing different images. So we're going to need these in a minute. So not just this second, but OK. So let's take someone who has good depth perception. Let's assume that Mr. Beckham has some good depth perception. He obviously hasn't got very good legs at the moment, but there we go. So we've got those two eyes simply because each eye shows us a slightly different picture of the world around. And you, can do, you, you must have done this. You close one eye, then the other. And as you switch between them, things tend to move. And your brain decodes those two images. It can do, your brain's doing a fantastic amount of maths and trigonometry, basically. To show you that you have these different, different pictures means it, the object you're looking at must be at some distance away. And so if you have a little cube, for example, if you are looking at a cube straight on, if you look with only your left eye, you get a slightly different picture than if you look with your right eye, and that's because your eyes are in slightly different places. Okay. So if we take our example, um, what we can do is, okay, you can put your glasses on now. So the, if we now colour code the left eye and the right eye images separately, and I'm going to stand back so I can see it as well. If we colour code those separately, okay, they look slightly different. Again, just try closing one eye or the other, and you can see that the, the, your colour perception will do. If you are slightly colour blind, Unfortunately, this technique doesn't work very well, for which I apologize. OK, so that's not 3D yet. But if we combine those left eye and right eye images into one image, our eyes are only picking up each eye because of these color filters. We're only seeing bits of the image. If we combine those into an image, there we go. <laughs> it should come out. Now, sometimes it takes a second for your eye to just get used to this. But just in case you're not feeling nauseous, let's have a look at it. OK, let's look at it a bit bigger. Uh -huh. Often I find if you just, if you, if you can't see it, just look at the loudspeaker off the left of the screen for a minute and just look what a nice loudspeaker it is. And then look back again and your eye will have relaxed a bit. And you go, okay. And if that's not good enough, well, we'll see if we can. Okay. Okay. So. So who in the room has been, who in the room has been to see Avatar at the cinema? Okay. Okay. So, so forgetting the storyline. Avatar works in basically the same way. Avatar works by having two images on screen. They have a slightly different technology. Instead of using these cheap red and blue filters, they use polarizing light filters, so it's clear. But that's basically the same technology. So we can do this. What well, we can keep these on there for a minute. Let me just go off stage again. We can take two pictures of the sun, and we can combine them and make them into a 3D image. Now, this one isn't the best, because Actually, what's happening here is the spacecraft had just been launched when this was taken. They're not very far apart, so our, basically our, our spacecraft a bit sort of boss-eyed. It's a bit squinty and it can't see properly. But we go on a bit. Okay, you should start to see that that, that starts to look a bit more like a hemisphere coming out of the screen. So if you, again, if, if it's not working for you, just read the title and come back to it again. You'll probably find your eye relaxes a bit into it. Okay. So can people start to see that that looks 3D? 
Okay, so you can see, and we can take multiple images. We can see the sun rotating. And we can start to see structures in 3D. So never before in all of human history have people ever been able to look at the sun in three dimensions. To see this, this spherical nature of the sun, it's always looked like a flat disk. So for the first time, we can actually start to see these 3D structures on the surface of the sun. And we'll start to be able to see things actually coming out of the sun towards us. OK, right. So studying the sun is really important. So we can take those off now. I'm afraid we finished with them. And I'd be very grateful I can have them back at the end. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about the sun. We started off talking about natural electricity, and we've talked about the sun. How, what's this got to do with the aurora, my interest, and, and electricity on Earth, and natural electricity? What's the effect on our planet? Well, our planet's magnetic, and I, I hope you'll, you'll appreciate that. Um, deep beneath our feet, there's some very strong, a large quantity of, of molten metal, basically, at the Earth's core, hot, churning around, and it generates a magnetic field. And it generates a magnetic field that looks a bit like that, a bit like a bar magnet. Um, so I can demonstrate that over here. So, okay, on this, oh, I've never done this on an OHP before, so we'll see if it works. Okay, this is, uh, this is actually just a little plate, and in each of these little cells, it looks like bubble wrap, but it isn't. In each of those cells, there's a little needle, if you like. Um, and we're happy that, that a magnetic a compass, for example, which is a bit like these needles, will, will start to point towards, towards the pole of a magnet, which I have there. Well, in the case of the Earth, let's just shake it up a bit. If we put a magnet in, if I just give this a tap, he's confidently hoping this is going to work. OK, there we go. So what we should start to see is that we get a pattern formed where we have um, magnetic field lines which come from one hemisphere and go round into the other. So they go from one pole to the other. That's the shape of a bar magnet's magnetic field. It's very similar to this one on screen at the moment. We have magnetic field lines that come out of one magnetic pole, stretch around, and go into the other one. Let's kill that for now. So the Earth's magnetic field looks a bit like this. It's kind of like a big bar magnet. And we're lucky to have it. Because, um, and if we want to see where the aurora occur, it should give us a clue as to what, what, what's something to do with the aurora, what's, what's the mechanism behind the aurora. That's an image of the aurora borealis taken from a satellite. And actually what we're looking at here is this is the equator, and Australia's just down here. And so this is... Um, East Asia over the top, at the top. And this is the North Pole region. You can see the glow of the Northern Lights, a bit like a crown. And actually, this is the glow of the Southern Lights. So we have the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, and the Southern Lights, which is the Aurora Australis. Both formed by the same thing. And obviously, well, from that, you can make a good guess that it's got something to do with these magnetic field lines. Um, and we're very lucky, because our, our planet's magnetic field actually likes a acts like a force field. It acts like a force field because Material coming out from the sun, so these aren't to scale, these cartoons, but material coming from the sun on the left is streaming past our planet at about 500 kilometers per second, pretty fast. Um, and as it's going past, because it's, it's plasma, it's this material which obeys the laws of electromagnetics, it can't easily get onto the magnetic field lines of our planet. It's, so what we'd be like is trying to get beads and quickly for, throwing them on a piece of string in some hope that they would somehow magically end up on the piece of string. Plasma can't leave or, or enter this magnetic field region, so it, it can't get in very easily. It can, but not easily. And so this acts like a big shield, and we live in a cavity in this area. This is the solar wind outside, and we live in a cavity inside called the magnetosphere, the sphere of influence of the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere. And inside that region, the Earth's magnetic field on the day side, it's squished. It's not like a bar magnet anymore, because going from left to right on this, the solar wind is pressing on the Earth's magnetic field, and it squishes it up. And on the right-hand side, actually, it stretches it out into a very long tail. And we live inside this tadpole shape of, of magnetic field. Um, it's a good job as well, and we'll come to that towards the end of the talk. But what's interesting is, is inside this region, there's lots of magnetic field gradients, lots of electric field gradients, lots of oscillating magnetic and electric fields. And that up there is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where scientists are using man-made electromagnetic fields to accelerate subatomic particles up to near the speed of light, to smash them apart so they can see what they're made of. So that's being done by people deliberately. Out in this region, the changing electromagnetic forces actually whip up particles that are naturally occurring, accelerate them, and what happens is they can funnel down into the magnetic field region near the poles. 
Now, what's this got to do with the solar wind? Well, actually, it's the constant blowing of the solar wind past the magnetic field of the Earth, which generates these mechanisms which allow material to be fed down into the, into the upper atmosphere. And when, those are, um, when that material rains down into the upper atmosphere, this sort of thing happens. So this is a picture of the northern lights taken from the space shuttle. And so you can see several things here, so I'll try and orient you. This is the space shuttle on the right. We're kind of looking out the rear view mirror. So this is the fin, the main stabilizer fin, and there's two big engines. So the space shuttle's on its side, and this is the cargo bay in the foreground. And if you look out, you look down at the Earth, you can see the, the limb of the horizon of the Earth there. You see the aurora borealis. It's a slightly greeny bluey color in this image. It's quite a thin layer, generally. Um, it's about 100 kilometers above the surface. This actually isn't the aurora touch, coming down and touching the ground, although there are some legends that say it does that but uh, they're not true. But basically, this is actually the aurora disappearing off and snaking off over the horizon. So that's just a perspective effect going away. You see this very thin layer of greeny-blue emissions, and then above it, the color starts to change from this greeny-blue to red. There's quite a sharp transition at about that altitude. So at about 200 kilometers altitude and above, it's this red color. And you can also see these stripes. So what you're looking at there, are those stripes, are the Earth's magnetic field lines. So in the polar region, where the magnetic field lines come down into the pole, they're guiding material down in to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. So we actually get some red and green light, red and green emissions of light, and it's actually coming from atomic oxygen. So there's oxygen at these high altitudes, not very much, it's very thin. But, what's, but there's something happening up there, and we can do um, some analysis, and it tells us that the, the light's coming from oxygen up at those high altitudes. So what's causing the light? Well, we've got a couple of explanations, and then we'll do a demo. But this is my cartoon of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, over, the, over the polar regions. We've got the Earth at the bottom. And this spotty region is the very top of the Earth's atmosphere. It's a, bit, it's a bit thin, it's a bit faint. Very high energy material, accelerated in the magnetosphere, is coming down from space and hitting the top of the Earth's atmosphere. So have these very electrically charged particles slamming into the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And there's a collision there, and it makes some light. Again, we'll come to in a moment what actually makes the light. And we get these faint patterns of the aurora that move around. And these are occurring at altitudes from about 100 to 200 kilometers. So if you're in a plane, a little a, you know, jumbo jet going to the States, for example, this is occurring at about, uh, about 90 kilometers above your head. And if you're flying in the space shuttle at about, say, 500 kilometers altitude, it's happening a long way beneath you. But those, those material flowing from space is actually electrically charged material. It's an electric current. It's the motion of charge. That's what you have in a wire. So that motion of charge will actually cause some very strong magnetic field disturbances as well, which you can detect from the ground. So you end up with an aurora borealis that looks like this. You've got your green and your red, and you've got different patterns. But where's the light actually coming? What's making the light? Does anyone have any idea? OK, well, there's a bit of physics involved. And it's something to do with the nature of matter. Everything around us, so let's, take a, let's just take a very simple hydrogen atom, which is a, a nucleus of a proton, and around it's flying an electron. If you give it some energy, it will accept that energy, but it doesn't generally like to have it. It likes to be in what we call a, a ground state. It likes to be nice and relaxed. And so it will take that energy, and this whole system will start to get a bit more energy. Actually, the electron will get most of that energy, the thing that's orbiting the nucleus, and it won't like it, and it will dump it overboard. It wants to get rid of it as quick as it can, and it, it relaxes back to its ground state of energy. And as it does so, the only way it can get rid of the energy is to throw out some radiation. So it throws out some light. If you do that with an oxygen atom high up in the Earth's atmosphere, then what happens is you get some energy. An electron will come in from space, hit your oxygen atom, give it a bit of energy. Um, and you may, if you haven't already, then you may well get, and you, but you continue to study science. You start to draw these energy level diagrams. Basically, you get some energy going from a low energy to a high because of the collision. And then you drop back down to a low energy in a couple of stages, usually, emitting some light each time you do it. So the light you're seeing are the gases getting rid of energy that's coming from space that they're not wanting. So we get this light as a, as a sort of nice byproduct. So when you next time, or if you ever see an aurora or ever see a picture on TV, what you're looking at in the night sky there, so in this arc, this is an auroral arc, so you can see almost moving around. I'm just going to dim this a minute because I need to do a demo in a moment. Um, when we see an auroral arc like that, then that motion is just different areas of the sky are being illuminated by this material coming in, causing the, uh, causing the atmospheric gases to get, get, give off some light. And it's exactly the same process as you get in a neon lamp. And so my display 
This is my kind of Aurora in a box. If we leave that on for a moment. It's the same process that's going on there. In there, we have glass tubes which are filled with gas, and we're putting an electric current through them. In this case, I've plugged it into the wall. The motion of that current, the motion of charged particles moving through the gas in, that, in each of those tubes is causing the gas to, to fluoresce slightly and give off some light. And obviously, we can change the pattern, change the flickering, and the ch by changing the current that's flying in and out and through those tubes. Now, in that case, we're doing it with a couple of different transformers. In the case of the northern lights, the changing pattern in the lights in the night sky is due to different processes going on in space, funneling this material into different parts of the sky. And that's why you get this changing pattern. OK, but that's one way of explaining it. But there is another way, but we'll, we'll have to do an experiment. So we all know that when you do experiments, you've got to put white coats on. So um, we'll do a quick experiment, but we'll have we'll also, well, there's two aspects to this experiment. One of them is physics, possibly with a bit of chemistry thrown in, but we won't worry about that. And the other one is sociological, very important sociological questions we need to answer. So the sociological part first. McDonald's restaurants. What has this got to do with the Northern Lights? Where is this going? I can hear you asking. OK, so you are aware there is a brand of restaurants called McDonald's then. OK. Um, so are there fans of McDonald's in the room? Yeah. Yeah. OK, OK. I would prepared to accept if you prefer Burger King, that will also do. OK. OK, OK. But we're not talking about KFC. OK. Right then, so in your, in your, if you go for one of the burgers, say a Big Mac or a, a Whopper or, or a hamburger or a cheeseburger, this is the important sociological bit. You always get some pickles. Some gherkins. OK. The important sociological question. Who chucks their gherkin away? Who fishes it out? OK. And, and who, who holds on to who eats them? OK. 50-50 split. You see, the country is divided. OK. Well, that is our, that's our sociological study of, where, of who likes gherkins or not. But actually, we're going to use one of these to demonstrate the physics behind the Northern Lights. So first things first, I've got, my, uh, I've got my white coat, so I must be nearly ready. <coughs> OK. And I've got my safety goggles. OK, so now I would, I would be happy to offer anyone a gherkin who wants one, but I haven't got very many. Sorry, I'm actually down to my last gherkin. So if this experiment doesn't work first time, I'm very sorry, you're not going to get it at all. So first things first, let's find, oh, good grief. OK, so so we have one, one whole gherkin. OK, so it's just a little cucumber, and it's salted and vinegared and herbed and all that sort of thing. And obviously, you normally slice that up and put it in your burger. So we're not going to do that today. We're going to do a slightly different experiment. I'm just going to unplug that. Uh, the experiment we're going to do today is a little bit more fun than, than whether or not we like these to eat these. What we're going to do is I have a special device here, and we're just going to put 240 volts through it and see what happens. OK, so I should now say this is actually potentially a highly dangerous experiment. So don't even think about trying it at home. You've got to know what you're doing. Notice how I have the plug in one hand so I know that it's not plugged in. OK. Right, so what I'm going to do is I forgot to clean this last time I did it, so I'll just make sure my electrodes are nice and clean. Right, that'll do. OK, right then, so. So the gherkin is now contained and safe. So what we're going to do is, I'm, bit, I am, I'm aware that not all of you will be able to see this straight away, so. OK, so. Okay. Okay, right, there we go. So, okay, so we now have our gherkin, and thanks to the wonders of gherkin cam, what you can see is that actually it's impaled here on a couple of spikes. You may mistake those for household nails, but that's your problem. Uh, and actually, so, and we've got a wire coming out the back which is ready to plug in. Let me just check, it's not turned on. Okay, <clears throat> so. So, does anyone want to have a guess what's going to happen? OK. There's a few correct, a few incorrect there. I'm going to, I'm going to take the lights out completely for a moment, just so that we can see this. So, OK. 
So if you can't see it directly, it's obviously on the screen. Right, so what I'll do is I'll just flick the switch now and turn it on, just making sure everything's OK. OK, so that's now on. There's 240 volts running through it. And there we go. So, so our, our pickle is now glowing like a light bulb really rather well. Uh, there's a few sparks coming off it, but we won't worry too much. OK, unfortunately, uh, I think smoke is going gonna, is gonna to put play off there. In the, there's a lot of smoke, so OK, let's stop. OK, I think, I think the gherkin is dead. OK, now, if any of you really like the smell of toasted gherkin, then sitting in the front row is a good thing to do, because there's plenty of smoke in there. I'll not do that too much, because we may set the smoke alarms off. So, um, <laughs> Oh, it really stinks. OK, so, so that's what happens when you put 240 volts through a gherkin. So let's get rid of gherkin, Cam. So, as I say, guys, please don't try that at home. This is 240 volts. It is actually surprisingly easy to kill yourself, so it's not, you shouldn't muck about. But what's gonna, what have we done there? We've put 240 volts. I've actually got an, another video version of this. Notice whoever made this video is very slapdash and not interested in safety. So they've just got two nails shoved into a gherkin <laughs> connected to the main. So obviously that's very dangerous indeed. Um, What's happened when we run that experiment is that the material inside the gherkin is being heated. The current running through, the current will run through, the electricity will run through because it's actually soaked in salt water. And does anyone know the chemical name for salt? Yeah, sodium chloride. So the salt and chloride ions. And when we run the current through, the salt and the chloride ions, the sodium and chloride ions, go in different directions. So what we find is that as we run the current through, it heats different regions of the, of the gherkin, and the sodium ion actually gets some energy, just like the, en the things up in the top atmosphere when the auroral material, uh, sorry, uh, energetic material comes from space. They get some energy from the electric current, and they dump it overboard. And, and in this case, with sodium, it gives out a yellow light. Does anyone else know what gives out a yellow light that's, powered, that's got sodium in it? Lemons. No, not lemons. <laughs> good guess, good guess. Street lights. Street lights contain sodium. There's sodium bulbs in there. So the color of a street lamp, that yellow-orange color, is the same color we got from our poor, recently demised gherkin in there. If anyone's hungry, by the way, they're really nice, honestly, toasted. So the same physical processes that give us street lights, everyday things like street lights or electric gherkins, or neon signs in shop windows, same thing as generating the aurora borealis. It's just there's some natural processes going on high in the Earth's atmosphere, driven by the sun, that, create, that give us the energy, instead of flicking a switch. And so if you take a look at a movie of where the aurora exists, actually, you find it in this region around the polar region, around the, around the North Pole. And the region, it's a ring, and not just actually just at the pole, is those magnetic field lines, if you remember the cartoon we were looking at, the Earth looking a bit like a tadpole, those magnetic field lines that come out of the North Polar region actually stretch off deep into the tail. Very empty, not much interesting happening on, very quiet. These inner field lines that occur from one pole to the other, that's where all the whiz-bang happens that fires material in. And they actually create a pattern that's a ring around the magnetic pole. And so the movies look a bit like that. So that's an image of the aurora taken in ultraviolet light again, not visible light, from a satellite. And you can see there the aurora moving around, dancing around. And I should have, if I set it up correctly. OK, yeah, if I can just tilt this. Oop, wrong way. OK, so you might be able to see that a movie of the Northern Lights taken from a satellite imager. And they occur actually in this region around the pole, actually generally where it's dark and not where it's light. So you can see them most easily where it's dark. And this movie will restart again in a moment. And it will keep running. And we can see they get this loop, this, this oval, this crown-like region around the poles where we see the Northern Lights. So it's worth remembering, because when you look at images like that one on the globe and the one we're just looking at, if you ever get to see the northern lights and you've got this ribbon of light in the night sky, it's not just you that's being shown this. It's not just this little loop, this little arc, this little area. It can be a huge global phenomenon all around the world, and you're just seeing a bit of it in the sky above your head. So actually, you're, you're doing pretty well if you see a little bit of it, but it's going on all around the world. But that means if you want to see the aurora, you have to go to these higher latitude places underneath the aurora to see it. It occasionally comes to us, but not very often. So if you take a little look at um, 
a, a simple postcards kind of sketch visit of the aurora. Uh, uh, so if you go in different regions, your, your chances of seeing them would go from being very low where we are to being quite high in this oval region that surrounds the pole to being quite low again in the middle. But you can see the aurora Neuallesund in Spitsbergen, 75 degrees north magnetic, picture of the, the aurora there. Tromso in northern Norway, 70 degrees north, seeing the aurora. The aurora over Lancaster University, so up there, in 2005. This is only 51 degrees north magnetically. And Colorado in the USA, green and red aurora there in 2003. So you do see them from the UK, and typically it's about once a decade, whereas if you go up to somewhere in near northern, say, northern Norway, you'll see them most nights of the year. And so there are lots of legends that have grown up about what the aurora are. So we've been thinking about well, the physics of what the aurora are, the science that drives this electric phenomenon in space. But before we understood that, this is a great woodcut of the aurora seen over a medieval town. And you can see the entire sky has turned red. And so what we see here, this is actually from Central Europe. So perhaps once a decade or once every 20 years, the entire sky would turn red with one of these auroral displays. In the medieval period, when life expectancy was 30 or 40 years, this perhaps only happened once in your lifetime, maybe twice. And so this was a big event. And you can see here, this is the, the, well, the mayor or whatever you want to call him, the lord or the king, beckoning the, the aurora to go away. The wise men over here are looking at their scrolls and trying to figure out what's going on. And then the peasants over here are, are on their knees praying because they think it's an omen of war or death or famine or something. And some great contemporary accounts of, in the Middle Ages, entire areas of the countryside emptying as everyone went to the cities where the cathedrals were in order to just try and... Uh, make penance, really, and, and, and sort out uh, sort to, or apologize to, to God for, for anything they've done wrong and stop him sending these lights, which send uh, really bad messages of doom towards us. So you've seen things like the Northern Lights, the movie, the, the read the book, rather, or seen the, the movie, The Golden Compass, with the Northern Lights in it. That's all about the legends that we have today in the Northern Lights. And so the last thing I just wanted to talk about very quickly today was uh, even though you can see the aurora from places like Scotland, and so this is a picture of the aurora actually taken only two or three weeks ago uh, from northern Scotland, sorry, from central Scotland, where you can see the sky going ugly red and green colour. Most of the, ex the science actually goes on at high latitudes. So we have a radar stations, satellites we're flying in orbit, and we're concentrating on the polar regions. So for some reason, there's this stereotype that scientists look like this. <laughs> okay, and I have a... A slight confession to make in that I've got a white coat on. That was the first time I've put on a white coat since I did chemistry A-levels. So I never wear a white coat. When I'm going out to do experimental research, I wear coats that look like this. And the reason for this is because most of our research goes on in the Arctic Circle. So most of the research I do into Northern Lights takes place in Iceland, northern Norway, or up, right up there, Svalbard, Spitsbergen, the islands north, near the North Pole. And so the view out of my lab window looks like this. It's not just full of Bunsen burners and, and, and chemical bottles or, or, or and white coats. It's actually an Arctic environment. This is our laboratory, the sky above this place. And we have big tools and big facilities for doing this kind of work. So actually, science is not just about Bunsen burners and melting ice in buckets and things. Actually, it's getting out into the environment and finding out about how it, uh, how it works. And so to go into these polar environments, what you find is that, uh, well, the, these things are actually, I'm going to take this off before I start sweating. But we find that you have these enormous facilities up at high latitudes to go and work in. You've obviously got to work with the environment. So these are big 42-meter radar dishes. You have to skidoo to work in the morning. You can't take a car. You have to have a snowmobile. Um, you have to work with the local wildlife. So we have small Svalbard reindeers. Very cute. You have to be very respectful of the wildlife. What do you think the hazards are in this environment of working in that environment? Cold, yeah, someone said cold. A nice warm day, a clear day on Svalbard like this. If there's no wind, it's probably only about minus 25. With a good bit of wind, minus 30. The other big aspect, the other big risk is this fellow. Yeah. Everyone says, ah, oh, ah, oh. yeah. This is, this thing, if it was standing next to me, and thank goodness it isn't, it would be as tall to its, if it was on all fours, like a bear should be, its shoulders would be about the same height as me. Its head would be about this big, and standing on back legs, it could interfere with the light fittings. Okay? It can run at 30 miles an hour and kill just about anything. So, and they're perfectly camouflaged. So they spend most of their time doing this sort of thing, eating. 
Yeah. And so actually to do the science you need to do, to say study the northern lights, you want to study the, do the science, you've got to go up here. They have to treat, take, train you how to use a rifle. You get a rifle as you get off the plane. And I'm just a scientist and they give me, it's no good giving me a rifle, I couldn't hit a barn door. They give you a rifle, I should say, before anyone thinks we're cruel scientists. They give you a rifle to scare off the polar bears. If you shot one of these things, if you managed to kill it, which you're not going to do because they're just indestructible, if you killed it, um, there would be a forensic investigation. It would look like CSI, and they'd want to know why you killed it. And if it turned out you killed it and you didn't have to, your, light, you know, your head wasn't in danger of about to be torn off your shoulders, then actually you'd go to prison. They're a protected species. So we don't take these things out, hey, let's go and shoot a polar bear today, I'm bored. <laughs> um, and actually, if you look at its skull, there's a skull in the museum on Star. Polar bear skull's about this big. The bit with its, in between its eyes, the skull's about this thick, and its brain's about the size of your fist right at the back. So what happens if you shoot it right between the eyes from about three feet away? It really annoys it, and it eats you. And then, and then a few days later, it may or may not die. But they've got polar bear schools with bullets. Yeah, they, so this is, guy's going for a jog on Svalbard. He's going for a jog. He's running past the sign saying, beware everywhere on Svalbard. He's actually taking a bit of a risk there. He's not running with his rifle. Does anyone see the biathlon in the Winter Olympics? The guys on skis who have the rifle on their back in the harness? If you go out for a jog on Svalbard, you have one of those normally with a rifle. As you get to the supermarket, you, put, you park your, uh, you get in and you take your rifle off and put it in the gun rack in the supermarket. <laughs> take, lock it, get your trolley, you go and do your supermarket, you come back with your bags, get your gun back, off you go. So, <laughs> so science isn't all about that sort of thing. And science also isn't all just done by, by middle-aged white guys like me. There's people of all sizes, shapes and genders. It's one of those really good levelling subjects, actually. And so two of us, well, one of our students and researchers out there in Svalbard. So we do some exciting stuff, and we get to use some pretty cool bits of kit. We get to go to some pretty interesting places as well. Um, and the reason we're doing this is to understand really our planet's link to the space environment. And it's important for a few reasons. But one of the main reasons that it's important is because the kind of kit we use in the space environment, you know, we have all these stations up in the Arctic and the Antarctic and satellites in orbit around our planet and others to understand the space environment. But the reason we're doing that is because we need to understand the physics, firstly because we don't understand the science, and, and human beings are always very good at looking into things they don't really understand. But the final point I want to make is, as well as being really pretty, the things about science is it's useful in lots of different ways. So across the top I've got some pictures here of the, aurora, uh, the sun, the aurora borealis, viewed from the ground and from space. All these effects that we've been talking about here interact with the electricity supplies that we make. These are all electric effect. And actually, they interact with, say, power grids that deliver power around the world to our homes. So those long conducting lines of uh, electric wires will actually be interfered with by some of the processes we're going on about. So actually, some of these processes have, have done and can knock out power grids, and we need to understand that better. If you're flying at high altitude, the same particles that are bringing lots of energy into the upper atmosphere will actually also introduce a slightly higher radiation hazard to, to crews and passengers on airlines. Satellites are also at risk from damage from large solar storms. So we rely on our Earth's magnetic field to give them some shielding, but these get knocked out. And you just think how many things you use do satel use satellites. I'm not just talking about the sat nav in your car, which is very useful, or the, or the satellite TV. But think about all those planes you fly on that have satellite communication with the ground, satellite guidance to get them on the ground in the fog, the army that defends us, the, the border and security agencies that use it, the information systems that move in information around the world. Even if you haven't got satellite TV at home, when the BBC make a call between Washington and London, it goes via a satellite. So all our satellite services are vulnerable to the kind of things we've been talking about today, which gives us lovely, beautiful, pretty lights, but can damage things. Navigational effects can be disturbed by the magnetic disturbances that the northern lights produce. And so if you're, say, I've got a picture of an oil rig here, oil rig drilling, for example, they drill downwards. And I thought that was all they did. But they don't, they don't just drill down, they start drilling sideways then. And they steer those drill bits using a compass, basically. When the Earth's magnetic field is disturbed, when it's getting a good hammering from all the things going on in space, what we find is that their drilling can't carry on, and they have to stop 200,000 pounds a day to keep a rig going. All those guys are drinking tea and playing cards, because they've got to turn off their drill rigs, because something the sun's doing. Very important things for our economy and society. And lastly, I got into this field because I want to be an astronaut, but... I'm never going to do it, but there are people who are going to be astronauts, and you don't want to be in, in some particular orbits around the Earth when the sun is particularly active, simply because it's a really dodgy place to be in terms of the radiation. And so what I would say, if anything here has interested you today, and I've got a last slide here, fancy a job in space science, but actually if you fancy a job in science and you're really interested and you think, I'd like to do that for a career, 
spend your life doing science, going to some fantastic places, thinking about things that no one knows the answer to, then really this is kind of the route map that you're going to probably be taking. So your GCSEs, including science, which will get you to your A-level stage with the sciences you're interested in, be it physics, chemistry, or biology. And from that point, that's your access into a university degree course. So, the, you know, so I'm talking about physics, so physics degree, typically three or four years, four years if you want to go into research. And following that, three years of postgraduate study, where actually you're just doing research. There's no lectures, no classes to go to. You're working on research. So a lot of our students here on campus have done this stage. They've already got a degree. They've got a bachelor's degree, perhaps. They're now working on their PhD, their doctorate, doing research. And that's a really great time. Three years, just no worries, just working exactly on what you want to work on, on, on a research problem. And so what I would say is, if you're interested in science, that's the way to do it. And uh, if you'd like to talk to us more about science generally or here at Lancaster University, then feel free to ask any questions. All right, thanks very much.